In this section, we'll discuss the advantages of the Hamiltonian dynamical equations over the Lagrangian dynamical equations. One of the important advantages of, our, of Hamilton's equations over the Lagrange's equations is the fact that uh, the dynamical equations are described by uh, first-order differential equations. And so let's see what that looks like exactly. So in uh, the Lagrangian formulation, we very often end up with an equation that looks like this. If we have one generalized coordinate, uh, the final equation that we get for the dynamics of the system looks like this. So for instance, if we have a particle traveling along one direction, uh, the x direction, subject to some potential for a field ux, then the Lagrangian, which is a function of x and x dot, uh, will be 1 half m x dot squared minus u of x. And so the Lagrangian uh, dynamical equations, of course, are then just this equal to this. And so this is, in, our, in this particular case, this is going to turn into mx double dot is equal to uh, whatever the derivative of, of u with respect to x is, or mx double dot plus this partial is equal to 0. And so this equation resembles uh, this equation up here. And so you can see right off the bat that we have a second order differential equation that we have to solve in order to solve the dynamics uh, for the system. But by defining a new variable, in this case a generalized momentum, we can reduce uh, the dynamical equations by one order in the differential equations. And so uh, instead of getting uh, a second order differential equation for Q, we get two first order differential equations according to Hamilton's equation. So we get this, and we get this. And so for one uh, coordinate, well, for a system with one degree of freedom, we get equations that look like this. There's an f of q and p, so the q dot may depend on q and p, and p dot may also depend on Q and P. If we have multiple coordinates, though, multiple degrees of freedom for the system, then we can define a vector Q to be all the Qs that we have, Q1, Q2, etc., and a vector P to be all the generalized momenta we have, P1, P2, however many coordinates we need, and then we can uh, rewrite the dynamical equations um, using these vectors. So q dot vector will be some vector function. So f is now a vector itself, which is a function of two vectors, the q vectors and the p vectors. And p vector dot will likewise be some vector function of the q vectors, the q vector and the p vector. Okay, so we have two uh, first-order differential equations that we have to solve in order to uh, do dynamics in the Hamiltonian system, as opposed to, uh, excuse me, so we have two vector equations now uh, in the Hamiltonian equations in the, uh, for dynamics. Uh, in the Lagrangian formulation, then we have uh, one second-order differential equation to solve. So again, to give a concrete example, imagine we just have a particle moving in three dimensions uh, through space, subject to some potential, which depends on the position. So we can write a Lagrangian using Cartesian coordinates, like this. So there's our kinetic energy, as usual, minus the potential energy, which is going to depend on position. And then our Lagrange's equation looks like this for x. And something similar for y and z. But of course, uh, in, in formulating our Hamiltonian mechanics, uh, we, we convert this term here into px. So according to Lagrange, we're going to get uh, this equation is going to become m 
x double dot is equal to whatever the x derivative of the potential energy is. But according to Hamilton, the equation is going to look like this. And so employing the new q and p vectors suggested by the book, so recall we had this equation, for uh, q dot vector, and this equation for p dot vector, when we employ the Hamilton dynamics. So for the Hamilton dynamics, we see that uh, px dot py dot and pz dot, that's a vector, and that's going to be equal to minus the partial of the potential energy with respect to each of these conjugate coordinates. And so this is, this side of the equation over here, that's our g vector. And so I'm explaining all this just to make it more concrete what exactly the book is, means when it talks about these vector equations. Okay, So now the book suggests a further simplification. It says, well, why don't we just combine the q and the p vectors into one big vector? And so now, rather than writing the p and the q separately, we'll just write them all together. And so now this vector is going to look like q1, q2, dot, 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 and then p1, p2. And so for the problem we're considering, the specific problem of the particle moving in this field, we're going to get this, uh, this uh, z vector. And don't be too confused by the fact we're using z vector here and then the coordinate z here. Those are meant to be two different things. Py, pz. So now our z vector looks like this. This uh, vector the book calls a phase space vector. And this is in distinction from a uh, configuration space vector, which just deals with the uh, coordinates and the velocities for those coordinates, as we discussed in previous sections. And so it turns out that um, we can write the Hamilton equations um, in terms of just this phase space vector. It's going to look like this. Uh, z dot is just going to be some other vector function, h, which is itself a function of z. And so we have a, an equation of the form, uh, as the book points out, our first derivative of z is just equal to some function of z. And one advantage of the Hamilton uh, formulation is that there's an enormous amount of mathematical literature dealing with equations of this kind. And so we can use all of that mathematical literature to leverage uh, and solve these problems. Uh, in a way that it's a little more difficult to do when we have the uh, Lagrangian formulation where we don't have a nice, clean, simple equation of this form. And then finally, the book introduces the idea of a canonical transformation. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to go into these um, in detail here in this class, but they represent the, the, the reason, actually, the main reason why we use Hamilton uh, mechanics in advanced formulations of mechanics over the Lagrangian formulation. The basic idea is that you can take some combination of your generalized coordinates and make a new generalized coordinate, in this case capital Q. You can do the same thing for the generalized momenta. And because of the way the Hamilton and Lagrangian equations are formulated, uh, we can actually write the dynamical equations using any generalized coordinate we like as long as it behaves certain prop as long as it obeys certain properties. Um, in, in fact, we don't even have to take uh, generalized coordinates Q that only depend on the generalized coordinates Q. We could take generalized coordinates that actually depend upon combinations of the generalized coordinates and the generalized momenta. Same for the generalized momenta, we can come up with a new set of uh, coordinates that actually combines the generalized momenta and generalized coordinates. Um, and this is a tremendous advantage of Hamilton over Lagrange.
Um, very often, in fact, when we employ canonical transformations, what we're going to do is look for combinations of, of little q and little p that can give us new coordinates that are then ignorable. So one of the big goals of the most advanced formulations of, of dynamics in the Hamilton system is to come up with generalized co coordinates and momenta uh, that are ignorable. And so that simplifies the dynamics of the system tremendously. Just to give you a concrete example of what exactly I'm talking about here, think, think again of our central force problem. We've got two forces, two masses interacting. Um, usually we, we think of this problem in terms of the uh, polar coordinate system, but we don't have to. We could imagine trying to do this whole problem uh, in Cartesian coordinates. And so that might look something like this. So here's the kinetic energy associated with moment, uh, motion of the first mass and the kinetic energy associated with motion of the second mass. And in, and in principle, uh, this equation holds uh, this dynamical, uh, excuse me, this Lagrangian applies just as well as the usual uh, Lagrangian that we use for this problem. Um, and so you could do this whole problem just using the Cartesian coordinates for each of the masses individually, and the problem would be enormously complicated. But to avoid all of that, we usually transform from this set of uh, Cartesian coordinates into uh, the polar coordinate system. And so that's an example of a, the kind of coordinate transformation we're thinking about here. Um, if we were, if we transform into this polar coordinate system, and then further transform in, uh, into uh, the uh, Hamilton's uh, formulation of the problem, we find that the uh, momentum associated with phi, we find that the momentum associated with phi is conserved. Um, and so this becomes an ignorable coordinate. And so this is the kind of transformation we're talking about here, uh, canonical transformation, such that one of the coordinates or more of the coordinates actually become ignorable. So that's the, the significant advantage of, Ham of Hamilton over Lagrange, uh, is that we can very often come up with a canonical transformation which makes some number of the coordinates ignorable. And unfortunately, that's all we can say about uh, this process uh, in this class.